Hello, everyone, and inside today's Locked On Canadians, it is six straight losses for Montreal, and that's just okay because there are probably two more on the horizon this week. I have your game recap and so much more inside today's show. You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 803 of Locked On Canadians, where you're a daily Montreal Canadiens podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where you get your team every single day. Thank you for subscribing wherever you get your daily podcast, or if you're watching me on YouTube, thank you for subscribing. Ring the bell to get notified every time we post a brand new episode or go live, etc. I am, once again, your host for this week. I am Scott Matla. You can follow me on Twitter at Scott Matla. Let's jump right into things. It is Monday. There is a lot going on in the land of the Montreal Canadiens. We've got so much to cover in the show, including NCAA prospects. We've got upcoming Habs games, and it is Monday. That means it's three up and three down for this week. Let's dive into the actual games themselves. The Canadiens played Saturday night. They lost 3-1 to the New Jersey Devils in a game that the Canadiens were very much outclassed for most of this but their effort was there that they kept the devils on their heels for parts of this game in that they hit post they kind of flubbed a couple of chances in the crease there new jersey didn't so much take advantage of their two nothing lead in a way that they could have they allowed the canadians to kind of hang around dennis gurianov got on the board thanks to rem pitlick forcing a damon severson turnover gurianov just blasted one past akira schmid lost 3-1 thomas tatar with the empty net goal Six in a row. They still sit at the sixth best lottery odds right now. They are one point ahead of Arizona, who collected an overtime point against the Colorado Avalanche. My thing with this game is, once again, they're losing competitively. They're not falling over. They're not wilting. They're not just collapsing on themselves like a house of cards in the wind or anything like that. The Montreal Canadiens, despite not being a good hockey team, are competitive in their six losses. One goal, one goal, one goal, one goal, one goal, two goals. Out of six straight losses, they've been competitive in all of them. They haven't won any of them, mind you. They forced a shootout in two of them. But at the same time, they're getting, they're building good habits. And I talked about this on the sick podcast with Matt O'Hayan uh, on Friday night is that they're building a culture with this is that they're not just going to roll over and die here on this season. They're making themselves a tough out here. They took Carolina into a shootout. Carolina got pushed there a lot. They pushed the Rangers to a shootout in a game. The Canadians probably should have won to be quite honest with you. The devil's game is the first one where there was a little bit of a gap of difference and the devils still were unable to really truly put away the Canadians until that empty net goal. The Canadians are not a good team but they are absolutely a feisty pain in the ass on a schedule. If you are an opposing team here, they've played playoff teams. They played LA, played LA tight. They played Vegas, played Vegas tight, New York, New Jersey, Carolina. They've played these teams tight and they're doing it without most of their lineup here. It's Nick Suzuki and his band of merry men. At this point, Christian Dvorak hasn't played in a couple of games here. Chris Tierney is their only other regular NHL center besides Nick Suzuki. That's not exact. It is not like 2014 where Chris Tierney might've been able to fill that role. No, 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 no. It is 2023. The Montreal Canadians are relying on Nick Suzuki and Chris Tierney to get them over the line. Jonathan Drouin is playing center again. And you know what? The team's competitive. They're not winning, which is what you want. If you're on the tank, they're losing games, but they're losing them in such an effort that opposing teams cannot take them lightly because the Canadians do still have enough talent on this team that is working hard enough that they will absolutely make your life miserable. Mike Matheson and Caden Gooley are playing real, real well. We'll touch on those guys a little bit later on in the show. And upcoming this week, two big games, Colorado and Pittsburgh. And I look at this and that the Canadians haven't played a lot of back-to-backs 
recently, or at least not back to backs against good teams back to back. They played Anaheim and was it Anaheim and LA or was it LA and San? It doesn't matter. Regardless, they haven't played two back to back games against playoff teams. I think since they came back from the All Star break, where they beat the Rangers and beat the Islanders in back to back games. Part of that was also, you know, goaltending, important and everything. But I look at this and I go, Colorado is a team that can either put a beat down on the Canadians. They're still very good. Miko Ranton and Nathan McKinnon, Kel McCarr, et cetera. But they've also, they're missing that vibe they had last year. They're not quite the fearsome Colorado avalanche they were last year. They're still very good. Very, very good but the Canadians are going to be a stress test for them as well because the Canadians are a relentless team. They're not great, but they're still a stress test. And then Pittsburgh is one of the most confusing teams in the NHL. They're having trouble closing out games. Their lineup is far from what it could be. They're not getting good goaltending. If Tristan Jari does not start games, they're generally losing. The defense isn't what it was. The power play hasn't been what it was. The Canadians as a whole can take advantage of this Pittsburgh team here. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. They don't have the lineup depth to rotate guys in and out. They only have so many call-ups. I don't know what bodies they're expecting back. And I'm not expecting any right now. Doc's out indefinitely. You know, Gallagher's out another couple of weeks. There's not exactly, you know, people on the verge of coming back here. Jake Evans is skating a little bit before practice. So is Justin Barron. We don't know the extent of what Jordan Harris and Christian Dvorak's injuries are. They're going to roll into these games, and these guys are going to have to dig deep here, and it's going to be up to Martin St. Louis to kind of figure out what to do with these guys here. It's going to be a great week potentially for the tank. They could lose both these games. And like I said, their schedule is not easy down the stretch here. Their schedule is tough. I'm curious to see what the Canadians come up with in this. If they beat Pittsburgh, I would not be surprised just because the Penguins have been waffling and teetering on the edge of just seasonal disaster here. And Colorado is still fighting for their playoff lives. They're likely going to make the playoffs, but they don't have the aura they had last year. And the team like the Canadians is going to have to bring something out of them in this. And I think they can do that. The biggest thing is, can you guys be competitive? I think they absolutely can. I'm just very curious what this week holds here because the Canadians are still missing bodies. However, There is good news on that front of missing bodies because, quite frankly, NCAA seasons are starting to come to a close here, and that's good news for the Montreal Canadiens. But that's going to come later on in this episode here. But coming up next, it is time for three up and three down. We're going to talk about some of our down lists. There isn't much on there, so it might be a little bit shorter, but we're going to get into that all coming up next. But first, today's show is brought to you by our friends at Athletic Greens. They are the best way to start your morning. It's how I start my morning because I want to have the most energy, feel the most rested, and get my day started on the right foot. I don't like taking a million different pills and supplements and everything. With Athletic Greens, with one scoop, you get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to get your day started right. They help boost your immune system, your nervous system, your gut health help you with focus, fighting aging, and helping with recovery. There's so much that you can do with Athletic Greens. It's got over 7,000 five-star reviews. It's recommended by professional athletes. It's lifestyle-friendly. So if you are dairy-free or vegan or gluten-free, Athletic Greens can work for you, and they are a carbon-neutral organization helping keep our rainforest and forest and everything else in great shape. So right now it is time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water. That's it. No need for a million different pills, supplements, trying to figure out how much to take just one scoop every morning. And to make it even easier, athletic greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and arm yourself with daily nutritional insurance. We are back here at Lockdown Canadians. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians, wherever you get your daily podcasts, YouTube, everywhere. Please and thank you for your support. If you are new here, which welcome. 
Welcome to my slow descent into insanity without my co-host, who is taking a well-deserved vacation. But don't worry, Laura will be back before too long. Monday's episodes are always dedicated to typically one thing, depending on game schedules. It is three up and three down, where we tend to break down who's rising and who is falling in the Montreal Canadiens organization. We always start with the down because we always want to end on a positive note. And the biggest thing is here, and I know he scored against the Devils, and I know we had him on our up list just before I went on vacation. It's been a tougher week for Dennis Gurionov, and I am understanding why Dallas was willing to part with their first overall pick. I like Dennis Gurionov as a player. Dude's fast, can rip the puck, but he has one speed, and that is forward. He's missing some of the, if he were to add some agility into his game, a little bit of deception, I think there's another level there to be unlocked for Denis Gurionov. I think he's a fantastic complimentary player on this team right now. I do not think he is a top line player. I would not be opposed to seeing him there for a time, but uh, Raphael Harvey Pinard and Jesse Alonen probably aren't going to give up those spots anytime soon, nor should they. Denis Gurionov is someone who leaves me wanting more in a player. And as I've said, I love his skill set. He can shoot. He can skate. He's got size to get to the front of the net there. But he's got four goals this year. Two of which have come with the Canadians. There's work to be done here. And I'm curious what the Canadians are going to do with him. And what kind of might sting a little bit more is that uh, Evgeny Dodonov in Dallas now has, I believe, seven points in eight games, which before everyone thinks this is going to be Ken Hughes made a bad trade, player went from bad team to player went to good team. Of course, the points are going to follow that. If you're wondering why Arturi Lekkanen looked so good in Colorado last year, Colorado, not Colorado, and it's continued to look good there. Player went from bad team to player went to good team. I bet you if the Canadians traded Mike Hoffman for Denis Gurionov, he'd probably have the same amount of uh, production right now too. I think Gurionov is a curious case, and I'm wondering if Kent Hughes isn't going to qualify him, but is willing to bring him back at a lower salary next year because his qualifying offer, I believe, is $3 million plus. That is... That's not a small amount of change, especially with Cole Caulfield's contract is up potentially and potential entry level deals coming up here. You've got guys that you're going to need to sign in the Canadians organization that will probably take precedence over a Dennis Gurionov at this point. And what I want to tie into that a little bit in this down segment here, and this is not because I think they've been playing badly. In fact, all their advanced metrics say that they're still putting in fantastic performances I feel like it's been a weirdly tough week for Nick Suzuki. He looks like someone who is playing a lot of minutes without a supporting cast to ease the weight of the world on his shoulders right now. He's playing very good hockey against the Devils. His metrics were fantastic. But there's a little bit of polish that was just missing in this here. And I'm hoping that Martin St. Louis has some kind of plan to help get him in order, not in order here. That's, that's a little bit too negative is to kind of get those points free flowing again. Harvey Pinard and Yelonen have hit crossbars, had been robbed on saves, hit the outside of the post. The points are there. It's just the bounces have not been. And I'm wondering once Christian Dvorak comes back or whomever they might have coming into play center here, if, Nick Suzuki can get his point totals flowing in the right direction here. And honestly, I think he can. I absolutely think he can. He's playing very good hockey. He's playing commendably with little to no supporting cast. All due respect to the guys on this team. This is not Cole Caulfield. This is not Kirby Doc. This is not Brendan Gallagher. These are not bodies that make up an NHL like cup contending team right now. Alex Belzeal and Chris Tierney, Chris Tierney, Michael Pizzetta, Anthony Richard, they're putting in efforts. Jonathan Duran is putting in efforts. But you're going to go out there and you're going to play Nico Heischer and Jesper Bratt and Jack Hughes 
and Timo Meyer and Thomas Tatar. And then you're going to play Nathan McKinnon and Miko Rantanen and Arturi Lekkinen. And then you're going to play Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot being asked of Nick Suzuki right now. My big question is, can Martin St. Louis figure out a way to get his captain and top player going again? Mike Matheson and Caden Gooley look phenomenal since coming back from their injuries. They have support that they can, they have defensive depth to work around here a little bit. It's not always the flashiest, but they have it down the middle right now. It's Suzuki. It's Tierney. It's Drew and it's Richard or Belziel on a given night. That's not a lot. That's quite frankly, you know, a guy who's a winger and, you know, two AHL, three AHL caliber centers and Nick Suzuki. Uh, I'm wondering if they have a college free agent they have their eye on. And that's where my attention is kind of focused right now. I know the Canadians are going to lose games. Simple as that. They're going to lose. Stop, stop earning points in them. If you're going to lose, lose within a goal in regulation. The efforts there don't get any more points. Vancouver keeps winning for some reason, which is hilarious. And Arizona keeps winning, which is hilarious for some reason. You're so close to the top five. I need Florida to start losing more, though, because Sergei Bobrovsky decided to turn the clock back and win a Vesna this year, apparently. So speaking of college free agents, the uh, divisional tournaments have started. There's big news around Sean Farrell, around Jaden Struble, around Boston University. We're going to dive into all of that and more in our up segment coming up next. But first, today's show is also brought to you by the folks at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat and you don't want all the fat and all the calories, then you got to try a Built Bar. It is a protein bar that is healthy and actually tasty, covered in 100% real chocolate. And guess what? They have so many unbelievable flavors. Churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. They have incredible macros, so low calories, low fat, and 17 grams of protein in every single bar. And you can walk into your local Sam's Club or Walmart to pick them up now, or you can go to built.com and build your own box and get them shipped right to your door. There's a flavor for everyone, and they are great at any time. I've taken them hiking. I've used them after the gym as my breakfast on the way to work if I don't have time to make something in the morning. If I need that midday pick-me-up, Built Bar is there for me at any time. And like I said, 100% real chocolate. It's like a dessert without any of the negative side effects of that. You got to give Built Bar a shot. So check it out at your local Sam's or Walmart or Built.com. Build yourself a box and see what the hype is all about. I am back here at Locked On Canadians. And it is the final segment of our Monday show. That is the up segment where we... You know, we talk about the good things here. Before I get into the college side of things, I have to shout out two players. Well, three players. The Canadians' fourth line rotating through. Chris Tierney has been promoted, I think. I'm not. The lines are a mess outside of Nick Suzuki's line on a given night. But Chris Tierney, Alex Belzeal, Michael Pozzetta, Rem Pitlick, Anthony Richard. These guys are primarily AHL guys. Chris Tierney was an NHL contract this year, but I'm grouping him in here because he is the one centering on that line there. They have been putting in work, capital W, capital O, capital R, capital K, three exclamation points, work in these games. They took it to the Rangers. They took it to the Hurricanes. They were the ones who started to get the Canadians back into the game Against the Devils, Rem Pitlick's forecheck, like I said, is the one that set up Dennis Gurionov's goal. Alex Belzeal had his goal streak snapped. He had goals in three straight games. He has four on the season. He's doing everything you could ask of a guy playing like eight and a half to ten minutes a night. Michael Bazette is doing everything you could ask of a guy playing eight and a half to ten minutes a night. And he's kind of reined in the boneheaded penalties. We talked about this earlier in the year is that you got to keep your temper in check here. The Canadians know they're playing shorthanded to begin with, and they're doing their best to stay out of the box. And Michael Pozzetta, who was known a lot, I watched him a lot in the AHL, is a guy that didn't really need an excuse to cause a kerfuffle, to get into the shenanigans and everything. He's agitating, but he's playing that role perfectly. He's physical. He'll hit anybody. He will go at anybody and finish his check. 
but he's not doing so at the cost of his own team's uh, things here. And Alex Belzeal is contributing really well. Chris Tierney is doing exactly what you want a guy to do. Couple of assists, couple of goals, nothing fancy, just simple hockey. And they're, and it's allowing Canadians to stay in the game. You can't really ask for much more from that from your fourth line or your bottom six made up of emergency call-ups at this point. Hardy Pinard and Yelonen are where they should be in the lineup, but these other call-ups, they're staking their claim. I still would like to see Joel Teasdale get some games here. I think he's earned that. Hell, Lucas Condado's probably earned a game or two if they had the call-ups for it. He has 16 goals in the AHL this season on an entry-level deal. He's Guys are playing well, and you're seeing that cascading effect that guys are playing well in the AHL or playing their role well and going up to the NHL and finding success. I'm wondering, can Mitchell Stevens be that guy if they need him? Will Xavier Simino be that guy next year? The opportunity is there, and I think that's a big part for the Canadians. And speaking of opportunity, let's take a look at the NCAA hockey tournament here. Boston University, still still in the Hockey East tournament. Even if they were to be eliminated, they're likely going to make the Frozen Four. Not that we were expecting Lane Hudson or Luke Tuck on an entry-level deal this year, next year potentially, but they've moved on to the next round. They had a couple of good games. I believe they're on to the next round of the Hockey East tournament anyways. They beat Vermont 7-3. Harvard advanced with a two-game sweep over Princeton in the ECAC uh, tournament. Sean Farrell, big part of that. They had a game where they won 6-1 and they won 4-0, I believe. They advanced, so we are still waiting on that. Sean Farrell continues to just be a dominant, dominant player for the Harvard Crimson. Really excited to see him potentially make that pro debut. They got to be favorites to win that tournament. Quinnipiac's going to be tough with their goalie who was up for the Mike Richter award. And I do want to ask some goalie people about uh, Yanev Previtz because I think he is someone that the Canadians, he's unsigned and he's one of the best goalies in the country. However, I'm not sure how much those stats are inflated because when I looked at one of the games Quinnipiac played against Yale this weekend, he had four saves through three periods. So things are, you know, potentially skewed and missing context in there. No, the news here, the bad side of this, and I guess this could have gone in the down segment, is Northeastern were upset by Providence in the hockey's tournament. Done. They would need a ton of help to make the Frozen Four tournament here. I mean, a ton of help. They are 19th in the pairwise rankings, I believe Joe Yurden pointed out yesterday, because he, as a Sabres person, is keeping an eye on Devin Levi. What this means for the Montreal Canadiens, however, Jane Struble is completing his last year as a collegiate hockey player. He is a senior this year. He is up for an entry-level contract now. I do not believe Northeastern is going to make it into the tournament, barring pure pairwise insanity. So what does that mean for Montreal? It means they might finally have some defensive reinforcements on the way. That if Justin Barron is hurt, cool, put him on IR. Play Jaden Struble. Uh, David St. Louis had a very good tweet and we've had Sebastian high and Tony Ferrari and other people on to talk about this. Jaden Struble's point totals, despite being a guy who his original profile was an aggressive offensive defenseman has def- redefined himself as a very good modern defensive defenseman. His defensive game has improved a ton. He has the range and the skating and the agility to be a plus asset on this team. He needs polishing. Do not get me wrong. He's already working with Adam Nicholas. Thank you to everyone on Twitter who pointed that out to me. I was unaware of that fact already. And I think getting him in here with Martin St. Louis and Stefan Robida and with the whole development staff, even if he's going to play for the Rocket to start, Lord knows they could use the help as well because everyone's banged up a little bit there as well. I think the opportunity is there for Jaden Struble to sign that entry-level deal, kind of like Jordan Harris did. uh, I think it was last year, actually, was Jordan Harris. It was around this time that this was happening again. And I think on the plus side, I think Jaden Struble is someone who will absolutely thrive under Martin St. Louis, where he can be a little bit more aggressive and play off of feelings and reads more than in a hard line structure some structure still necessary but i do think that jaden struble 
will be around the corner from signing with the Canadians in the relative near future. That is at least my hope. I think I, I would feel kind of hard pressed and hard done that if they didn't give him an opportunity here, because some team will see that athleticism, that physicality, that meanness that Struble has in his game, that college hockey restricts how much, you know, shenaniganery happens on a given basis. I want to see Struble playing. He's got a massive frame, massive build. He's ridiculously strong and a good, powerful skater. If he can become a more modern version of Joel Edmondson with better skating, the odd goal and assist here, I think his offensive upside is higher there. It's not quite where Jordan Harris is. So I think Jordan Harris is a very good power play quarterback. I think Struble would be a very good, you know, breakout skater there. He will be the guy players defer to on their breakouts. He's someone I would like to see the Canadians give an opportunity to because letting him go, I can't help but feel some other team's going to scoop him up. And what's going to happen is they're going to unlock that potential. I don't want to see the Canadians give up on these guys before they've been given an opportunity. I understand limited contracts and everything, but sooner or later, you're going to be losing Joel Edmondson, David Savard, a Chris Weidman. You're going to need young reinforcements here. And I think Jaden Struble, even if he's playing in the NHL now and is primarily an AHL guy next season is fine because the development tiers are there. And I think it's a huge opportunity for him to show what he's got. And it gives Canadians fans one more reason to tune in to watch these young guys. Yeah, Nick Suzuki is great. Yeah, you're watching Caden Gooley thrive. You're watching Harvey Pennard and Jesse Alone and, you know, play well in the top six. Here's another name to keep an eye on. And obviously, as tournaments continue to go on here, we'll keep an eye on Europe. I'm going to try and set up something with Patrick Baxell for the next week here. I've got so many other guests I want to bring into you. So please make sure you are following us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can follow myself at Scott Matla. You know, subscribe wherever you get your daily podcasts. Thank you so much if you already are. If you're watching me on YouTube, ring the bell to get notified every time we post a brand new episode. Folks, I will see you next time.